All right, so with these in mind, this is what we're going to focus on. And the neat thing is, is that the CAT scan narrows down the list of what it could be, okay? So this is what ground glass looks like. That's clear glass. I can see ground glass is it's blurry, okay? So that's what ground glass is. This is an x-ray that's ground glass. We used to call it interstitial. Nice, beautiful ground glass scan. By definition, you have blood vessels in the opacity. If you looked at the lung, the interstitial is thickened and the alveoli are getting congested. Here's the most important point. What if it is ground glass? What's your differential? Well, it's community-acquired pneumonias, it's other viruses, pneumocystis, atypicals. Uh, pertussis, cough can be both. Diffuse alveolar hemorrhage is a big one. Uh, these two, and chemo, and even just good old pulmonary edema. Now, if you break it down to acute, it covers everything I just said. You can throw in eosinophilic pneumonia. If it's been going on a long time, then cops may be more common, and then some rarer stuff may also be there. Now, if the ground glass, if the radiologist says crazy paving, that's like blink, 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 crazy paving, what's my differential? This is crazy paving in someone's back porch. This is crazy paving. Now, the pattern of ground glass has this uh, reticular pattern so you can see the architecture a little better. So that's crazy paving. Um, that is crazy paving. The classic crazy paving lungs look like that. And it looks like this with your lung grossly. And now we go through consolidation. I'll tell you what the differential is for crazy paving. Uh, so consolidation is usually low bar. It's dense. You may see an air bronchogram, but you don't see blood vessels. There's the lung. And it's like a liver. It's hard to make out the architecture. And then most importantly, it's either half, back, cap, some of the chronic pneumonias, and boot cop. So nothing too exotic there. Here's a nice schematic. Can't see blood vessels, can't see, and it's just not as dense. All right. And then this is in the face of ground glass. And now I have nodules that are one centimeter. This is a case of disseminated fusarium with dissemination hematogenous. And you want to notice that it's not just in the periphery, it's everywhere. So you can say it got there through the bloodstream instead of inhaled it. So the pattern is important. So of course, seeing that it's in your blood with staph oil, septic emboli, other bugs, the fusarium, these other ones, Lemire syndrome, endocarditis. Now, even the mycobacteriums can give you nodules of a centimeter, not usually two or three, but they can, but not commonly. These tend to be more in the periphery because you inhaled it, and it's got a pattern sometimes with bronchiectasis. And it's, of course, chronic. Now, this is a consolidation, but you can definitely tell it's nodular. This one is plural-based, and it has a halo of ground glass around it. This is aspergillus in a leukemic. So whenever you see it in a leukemic, it's always moles, and rarely is it ocardia, cop, bacteria, mycobacterium, and really rare rhodococcus and lymphoma. Someone claims in a note, but I can't verify it. This can't be lymphoma because it's cavitating. I haven't um, verified that statement yet. Okay, so it's an interesting statement some doctor made. You know, I don't know if it's real or not, so maybe it can or can't. So um, we'll start with you and we'll work our way around. So we got a white female leukemia, wheezing, congested child at home in the month of June. And forget COVID because COVID is not going to be discussed. So forget COVID. There's a little bit of ground glass down here. And the sinuses have some mucosal thickening. Not too impressive. So which bug occurs in June in general? I hope it screwed it all up. RSV? RSV is a winter virus. So is the flu. So we're left with two. 
Probably had enough. It's pair of flu. No. And then what is you three or four? Three. Thank you. Three. three. Okay. It's the summer one. Three is the summer oh, one. Okay. <laughs> now, for your question, this kid can't read. He's about one year old, and he has a sign called the blank sign in his trade. Yes. What is it? The staple sign, and that's called what disease when you take your kid in? Croup. What is croup caused by? Terror flu. So we're still on terror flu, right? All right. And there's the pathophysiology of croup. And what is the treatment of croup now if you go to the ER? It changes every five or ten years. First it was racemic epinephrine, then it was steam mist, then it was cold air, and now it's steroids again. Okay. <laughs> And then with my kids croup many years ago, three episodes, three different treatments, steroids work the best. Okay. This is a person with paraflu pneumonia, and I want you to notice it's nodular, but it's also a ground glass nodule. It's not a dense nodule. And notice the pattern is called centrilobular. So when the radiologist says centrilobular, that makes you start thinking viruses and atypicals. And then uh, tree and bud and century lobular to me are hard to pull apart. So you might see those two terms used interchangeably. If you follow people over time, these paraflu century lobular focal ground glass nodules will try to get consolidated sometimes. So we cleared this guy's paraflu off. So who knows the treatment of paraflu? Since ribavirin doesn't work, steroids don't work, cytosavir doesn't work, what are you going to do? Thank you. You're going to check their IgG. If it's less than 400, you give them IVIG. If it's over 400, you don't give them anything. So this guy was literally dying. The oxygen was going up. This is over four weeks. So we looked in the book and said, you know, interferon alpha kills all viruses. Let's give them that. And guess what? We didn't kill them. We actually cured them, and it cleared up nicely, and we published it. Now, if you go to the large websites of how to treat paraflu today, this isn't on it, but it's one case, okay? Uh, we tried it on other people, but it causes cephalopathy and confusion. So you have to weigh the pros and cons when you monkey with people's immune system. Okay. Now, interferon alpha 2b successfully cures paraflu. There it is. And the guy was in the hospital for 50 days and finally left. Okay. So that's how long we were battling him. Why did we do this? Well, here's the evidence that paraflu and interferon actually works. So there was a mechanism we could quote. Okay, for your question, we got a Hodgkin's lady transplant. She's rapidly going from upper to lower respiratory. She's wheezing. Three weeks later, she dies with ARDS, 100% oxygen. Month of January, it's not the flu and it's not COVID. And therefore, there's her lungs. Here it is getting worse. There's her sinuses. Which virus do you think did this? RSV. Right. So RSV is the killer of bone marrow patients. And what are you going to do for RSV? You're going to check their IgG. If it's 400 or less, give them IVIG. And if you want, you give them ribavirin instead of inhaled or IV, we give it in a pill. And that's what you do for RSV in the right setting. And this is showing you how bad RSV uh, kills bone marrow in E patients. Now, for your question, what is the newly discovered virus that causes respiratory viruses in kids, adults, and bone marrow? And it's on our respiratory viral panel. Right. And the other answer that is not on the our panel is Boca virus. So right now we have no way to diagnose Boca virus. Boca means mouth in Spanish, but the name came from bovine and cattle or cat. So um, Boca virus is a 
cargo kind of virus. All right, so there's metanumavirus, and it's in the uh, paramyxo family, same as RSV and paraflu. And uh, most of us uh, catch it at an early age. It's in birds. They knew about it for years. And they claim that everybody has had it sometime in their life. Some of you have had metanumavirus. And then here is the treatment of ribavirin and the IVIG. Although now um, we have a lot of dissenters saying there's no treatment of metanumo and ribavirin doesn't work. But myself and Anna Velez still give ribavirin orally. And we give IVIG if it's less than 400 IgG. So that's metanumavirus and Boca virus. We don't know what the treatment is and we can't detect it currently, but that can cause death in some people. So and the most common viruses that we find all year long are the rhinos, the paraflus and the RSV, sometimes the flu. We rarely see agno and we don't see a whole lot of metanumo. All right, and then as you mentioned, Paraflu-3 is the summer virus of these winter viruses. And you can see winter has definitely got more viruses than the summer. Now, um, this is a guy that has a focal ground glass pneumonia, and it's getting worse and worse, and he dies of respiratory failure in his bronchus negative. And he has CLL, another guy with CLL, throat breath, coughing, ground glass over six, four to six weeks. He gets worse, he dies, respiratory failure, and bronch is negative. So finally, we do an open lung biopsy. So for your question, what do you think this is? And your clue is you're looking at an obliterated bronchi. Thank you. So he has COP, cryptogenic organized pneumonia, bronchiolitis, bloodrins, organizing pneumonia. And uh, the treatment of that is steroids for three to six months. If it's mild, you can actually use azithromycin. And then in bone patients, they call it BOSS, bronchiolitis, bloodrins syndrome. And when they get a patient with a viral pneumonia, which can go into BOSS, boot, COP, whatever you want to call it, what do they give them to try to preserve their lungs? FAM, F-A-M, and what does FAM stand for? Luticasone, azithromycin, and monolucast. Thank you, FAM. And there's a zithro for mild cop. All right, you're up for the next one? Okay. So we got a female LHP and a T cell immunodeficiency, coughing, ground glass pneumonia, rhinos positive for six months, and progressive hypoxia, ground glass pneumonia. So six months of shedding rhino, and this is his lungs, and he actually survived that. So this is post rhinovirus cop, okay? And what do you treat that with? Steroids. So uh, this was published by one of our residents, and he talked about how rhinovirus and these immune suppressed people can turn into boot or cop. Okay. Uh, one of our med students looked at all of our rhinovirus at Moffitt, and the good news is nobody dies of rhinovirus. Some people can die of cop from chronic rhinovirus. What really kills you is this little box here which is the kind of fashions with your rhinovirus. So rhinovirus isn't that bad, but then I say that and all of a sudden someone writes an article and says, it's as bad as H1N1, but I don't agree with that, but there it is. <laughs> and then the hair is somebody actually dying of rhinovirus, but you can see some other bugs mentioned over there. So it's hard to tease out what's rhinovirus. Uh, and then, this is a scary thought, but why does azithromycin help with viral illnesses? Not that we're going to give it to everybody with a respiratory viral illness, but why would it be any better? And the answer is it actually increases the interferon and the interferon gene expression and has anti-rhinoviral activity in bronchial cells. 
So the only back to the alpha interferon again, by you know, would work. This is even more scarier. Leliquin inhibits rhinovirus. So here's the antibiotics doing stuff to viruses that we don't want the general public to know. <laughs> Okay. So, um, can watching your hands help with rhino? Unfortunately, in this study, it didn't reduce it. So if you've got rhino in the family at home, you're not going to escape it unless you do something through the air more than the hands. But hands can be important. By the way, um, the hand washing and the cleanliness with COVID, the one quote I heard is, if you catch COVID, it's usually respiratory, but there's a one in... 300 people who got it from their hands. So hands are lower on the list, but they're possible, okay? So rem remember that. I want you to know the CT findings of viral pneumonia. You see the words ground glass, tree and bud, and um, that is also called micronodules, crazy paving goes in there. And these are all the different findings of viruses in the lung. Okay. We got you for this one, all right? 35 year old, I'm on a progressive shortness of breath cough, three quarters of the antibiotics, not better. And the BAL, that should be a K, looks like milk or Mississippi mud, and is PAS staying positive? What is your diagnosis? So there's your bronch lavage, looks like milk. And there is the alveoli locked up and this is the PAS positive creature there. Um, I can't give you multiple choice, but we can throw it out to the whole group. Does this ring a bell? Non-infectious. Yeah. Oh, it's it's it. Right. It's 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 PAP. PAP. Pulmonary alveolar prognosis. And what is the immune defect in some of these patients? And they may benefit by killing their antibody producing cells. Anyone know? It is um, autoantibodies against GM CSF leading to PAC. So you give them drugs, the toxin, and you knock out the B cells, making the autoantibody. And the treatment is serial bronchoscopies to flush all that out. Now they wind up getting on chronic steroids for months during this whole event. And then they start showing up with nodules in their lungs that go to their brain. And they love this on the board question. So what's the nodule in the lung goes to your brain from chronic steroids? Cardia. Thank you. No, cardia. So you have the answer now. So this is the PAS positive abnormal lipid. This is the New England Journal of Medicine showing you how the autoantibodies against GMCSF is in many of the cases, but not all. So that is not infectious. Okay, we're turning the corner for the back row on the right. This is your question. This um, lady has a ground glass pneumonia, IgM hemolytic anemia, bullous meringitis, and hemolytic Multiform. So, what are you thinking of? And I have cerebellary tax. <laughs> it's an atypical that begins with M. Is that help? Yeah. Okay, so that is mycoplasma. Of course, nobody can have all these, but these are the extra lung manifestations of mycoplasma. Uh, notice the term they're using centrioblobular. So now we got that term back up here, also with atypicals. So a tree and bud is very similar to centrioblobular. Usually tree and bud, we think of MAC, and the nodules are clustering, and these are more ground glass. These are denser, but they're very close. And there's the alveoli where these nodules form. And this is the classic kind of pattern you see with the clustering. And when you see the multiple nodules in a century lobular, think of viruses and atypicals. And when you hear the word tree and bud, you think non-tuberculous mycobacterium, but of course, other things can do it. 
and our mycoplasma is notorious for causing extra pulmonary manifestations, and we covered the main ones. It likes the summer and fall, and it's 10% of CAF in one study. It's the IgM hemolytic anemia, and it likes your cerebellum. So if anyone has cerebellar involvement, you want to think of mycoplasma, EBV, and listeria. And cold agglutinins, we don't measure anymore, but they're positive, and now it's in our respiratory viral pan. Okay, for your question, you're a diabetic, you got out of your hot tub, and three <laughs> to five days later, you're on the bed with ground glass pneumonia. Your direct fluorescent antibody is positive, and it's growing on the charcoal yeast extract. What do you get from the water of air-conditioned hot tubs? So, what is that? Legionella. So, that's Legionella. Okay, so Legionella. We used to say, you know, these cause us hyponatremia, but that is um, what may or may not be taught in case other pneumonians can do it. And then the urine antigen can stay positive even after treatment for 90 days. So, you don't use that for test of cure. And it's intracellular. And then Legionella in cancer patients is not uncommon. We've had our cases. And here's a outbreak from a hot tub. And the drug of choice is Leviquin, and some people may add Rifampin. Some people like Azithro, and rarely do people like Doxy. And for mycoplasma, most people like Azithro, although the others may also work. And for chlamydia and pneumonia, most people like either azithro or doxy. There's actually articles showing people on clinolones getting chlamydia and pneumonia. So those are the three intracellular drugs. Okay, um, for your question, you get out of the hot tub and you're short of breath in 24 hours and you have ground glass pneumonia and it was really fast and I give you steroids and it clears up. You get the same thing going in a cave, cutting down sugar cane, throwing mulch in your yard, and shoveling hay in a barn. Hypersensitivity. Right. You have a hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and if you breathe pigeons, you can get it too. So you're breathing in antigen. So if you go in a cave and you breathe in all this histoantigen, you don't need intraconazole, you need steroids. Uh, this is mycobacterium bubbling up in the water. You're breathing in all this antigen of mycobacterium. Plus, if you like to pressure wash the mold off your house and your driveway, and you don't wear a mask and it's aerosolizing mycobacterium, you could get it that way. Okay, so these are hypersensitive pneumonitis. Now, what led when everybody shower head and water heater, and it loves to form nodules in the right middle lobe and the lingular area? MAC. And what's the syndrome called in a tall and female that's postmenopausal? Lady Winter. Lady Windermere syndrome, named after the Oscar Wilde play of a Victorian lady coughing in England when it wasn't ladylike to cough. And that's the play, and somebody liked the name, and now it's stuck, Lady Windermere Syndrome. And um, there you have the article telling you about it. Now, in our mycobacterium series at Moffitt, we see a lot of women with mycobacterium, some with cancer, some don't have cancer. So you see tons of it over at Moffitt. And another mycobacterium that grows quite rapidly looks just like it with bronchiectasis and with nodules, and it's growing rapidly. And that is the rapidly growing mycobacterium that likes the blood in the lungs and sometimes plastic surgery wounds. So you can actually have these ladies you follow for years, and they ultimately die with their lungs all eaten up. But for the most part, mycobacterium doesn't kill people. It doesn't usually shorten your life. And it doesn't usually make you need oxygen when you're 90 to 100, if managed, okay. But in a small subset, they shortens their life, they get sick, 
and they have multiple respiratory illnesses. So yes, people do die of mycobacterium, but not commonly. Okay, you're up for this one. 65 year old, these are all true stories. He's actually a physician. He has myelitis plastic syndrome, prolonged neutropenia. He had disseminated anesthesis from a central line that was removed, but he's still getting multiple skin lesions all over his body. He's on all of the antibiotics it's susceptible to, and new lesions keep popping up. And before we say, okay, this guy's just going to die of disseminated rapidly growing mycobacterium. So there's no one that's going to save him. You need a new novel approach. What are you going to give him? Steroids. Steroids. Good guess. <laughs> That'll give him some time for a while. Did the Senate investigation drop? Um, no. Okay. One isn't, one isn't. There's two answers. Well, but it's secure. It's so fascinating. But it's is investigational, and you are correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can do that. And uh, Dr. Uh, Canella will tell you all about it. Okay. Now, what did we do? This is go into the basic science literature. What part of your immune system is most important? What cytokine killing mycobacterium? Yeah. Which interferon? Yeah. Thank you. So guess what we gave him? Gamma interferon. We cured him, and his MDS went into remission. He needed less transfusions, and the MDS scheme doctor said we used to use gamma interferon for MDS before by days. So here's a guy who's cured by gamma interferon, and that was published. One case report. And then, of course, if you want to do it like this, this is phage therapy for mycobacterium infection, 20 patients, compassionate use, and you can do it that way too. This is your last ditch effort. Okay, um, in the beginning, we had a 30 year old asthma, wheezing, coughing, brown flex, IgE, elevated eosinophilia, bronchiasis. What do you think? AGPA. ABPA. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and the three, four presentations of aspergillus, ABPA, a fungus ball, and a cavity, chronic necrotizing and a COPD slowly growing, and the classic leukemia transplant angio invasion. And then out of, these are the diagnostic criteria for ABPA, and I gave you all four of them. And your classification is one to five with ABPA. And somewhere in here, you give them intravory with steroids with their asthma. And now, and if you have non burgers mycobacterium, you may show up with aspergillus because your lungs are a nice setting for it. And if you have ABPA, you may show up later on with non burgers mycobacterium. So these having both is not unusual. And this study shows you people with MTN, ABPA, who winds up with aspergillus. Not very much, but it does occur. Okay, for your question, um, every time this person comes in, they keep coming in with infiltrates, and it's always in the right middle lobe. So what syndrome do you think they have? So it's a trick question. The answer is right middle lobe syndrome. Uh, <laughs> now, there is no left lower lobe syndrome. There's no left upper lobe syndrome. There's only a right middle lobe, and it's a, a certain reason for it. You can have it um, from a kid to an adult with history there. You can have all kinds of diseases from asthma to cystic fibrosis to ciliary problems. You can have extra luminal obstruction of that right middle lobe bronchus, or you can have um, aspiration of foreign bodies and intraluminal causes. And the drugs you're prone to getting are CAT, aspergillus, and mycobacterium. And why is that? It's because the right middle lobe's bronchus is right with aspiration, it's easily kinked and occluded. So the right middle lobe is a perfect setup for chronic recurrent infection. So we had two people at Moffitt, we had to cut out the right middle lobe. One had mycobacterium and one had uh, aspergillus. So rarely you might need to cut the right middle lobe out. It keeps showing up 
in the same load. Okay, um, you're up for this one. A 20 year old with recurrent pneumonia and over his lifetime, he's grown out in the sputum. Pseudomonas originosa, butterholder isopatia, pseudomonas multifilia, bacteria, and mycobacterium abscesses. So, what does that make you think he has? Immune cystic fibrosis. Right. Very good. He has cystic fibrosis, so that's the buzz, and that's what you see in the setting of bronchiectasis. Now, for your question, this is one of the most common immunodeficiencies in your twenties. And you have bronchiectasis, recurrent strep, pneumo, pneumonia, otitis, and sinusitis. See that. And I got to give you more clues. Uh, and your IgG and IgA and IgM are low, and you get to get multiple choice. Three. You are correct. Common variable <laughs> immunodeficiency. And how do you get all that? You get gastric cancer because you have no IgA. Okay. You also get antiproliferative disorders and then the herpes viruses and everything else causing cancers because you don't have an adequate immunity. And if you're IgA deficient or common variable alone, you get all these different cancers, especially lymphomas and stomach cancer. Okay, um, you're up for this one. This is a ground glass pneumonia associated with adult onset wheezing, and uh, it's one of the atypical bugs, and I have not highlighted it yet. So it's the only one left, and it's not Legionella, and it's not Mycoplasma, so it's probably the third one. You remember the third one? Chlamydia. Chlamydia pneumonia, which has been renamed what? Hemophilia. Right. Chlamydia file or filla. Okay. Uh, it allows to cause asthma and wheezing, okay, and uh, bronchospasms, and those are very common. All right, and then the drug of choice, as we said, is either azithro or doxy, but levoquin is suspect. And why do these drugs work? Because they get good alveolar macrophage levels, epithelial lining fluid, and intracellular. Are you up for the next one? Sure. Okay, so I have a chronic pneumonia with hepatosplenomegaly. It's been going on for a month. And uh, they got quarter spots, which are red macules on their body. And um, this is her new pet. <laughs> so what do you think they have? It's like, I know that was saying it, but it's right. got, yeah. 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 The Chlamydia is the Cassii, psittacosis. Yeah. All right. Very good. Excellent. So that was uh, your clue. And then for our next question, uh, this is a published case that I I keep I keep I have four men playing poker in the kitchen, cats giving birth in the corner room, all getting pneumonia. One gets culture negative index of A. It's the associated with sheep and cats giving birth, and it's on the list of bioterrorism agents. What is it? Uh, Cielo Bernetti, which can mimic psittacosis with the spleen and the chronic pneumonia that sometimes is acute. Okay, next question. This kid's coughing so bad that um, he gets um, conjunctival hemorrhage and the adult who has it breaks his ribs from coughing. So what's going to break your rib? This strong cough. Right. Right. So that's Bordetella, which is ground glass. It's hazy. It's in our respiratory viral panel. And we do see outbreaks. And if you weren't wearing your mask, what do you take for it? Azithromycin and prophylaxis for all those that were exposed. And then how long does your a cellular pertussis vaccine last as an adult? Ten years. Three, years. three years. So it's already gone in three years. All right. Any cough more than a month to two weeks, a quarter of the time, it's usually due to portatella pertussis. Your cough can last two months. 
What are your drugs of choice? Macrolides, Bactrim, and Quinolones. So those are your choices for pertussis. Okay, for your question, the dog is sick, the dog has <laughs> kennel cough, the dog can die of pneumonia. There's a vaccine to prevent this, and now the human gets it. And it's a bordetella, and it's not pertussis, and it's not parapertussis. So which bordetella would this be? Any guess? Oh, correct. Bronchoseptica. There's the dog's lungs. And it's bronchoseptica, bordetella. Okay? And cats can have it too, but it's usually in dogs. All right. Just FYI, we had a case of someone kissing their dog, and they got that. Okay, there you have it. So the dog <laughs> and the breath. <laughs> Thank you. And were they in the suppressed or fairly healthy? Okay. Was the dog vaccinated? That's a great question. Most dogs don't have to be vaccinated. Yeah. We had a case. Right? By the way, we had a case and the dog was vaccinated, okay. but that's a great question. Okay. Probably so it can't occur, but it's not 100%. Usually, my section. Um, all right. <laughs> For your question, we got a right middle lobe infiltrate. We have strep pneumo, gram positive, coccyde diplos. We have no spleen, and we turn into septic shock, VIC, and our dry gangrene of our hands and feet. So, what's the two word syndrome of this phenomenon? And I'll give you the first word. Purpura blank. Thank you. It's purpura fulminans. Okay, strep pneumo is the big one. Nicerbin and Judy's. And the third one is catnocyte aphasia canemorsis. For your question, we have a COPD exacerbation and it's gram stain, gram negative cacobacilli. So, what's the leading cause of cat after strep pneumo? So that's homophilus influenza, but it could be more Xella catarellus. What type is it? It's non typable because of the <laughs> So we don't type them. It's non typable homophilus that's taken over. Okay. All right. A bilateral pneumonia in the hospital. And where do you want to give them? Pack. Cover this by the any drug that kills this bug, right? The anti pseudomonal drug. Okay, good. All right, and then we'll go for this one here. So, this is again for your question. He comes in twice. This is the first time. This is a classic story. He's a transplant, he's no longer neutropenic. He catches a virus, it doesn't matter, it could be the flu. He's now in septic shock, hypoxic. He has nodules that cavitate in six days. So I'm going to use the word necrotizing pneumonia acute after the flu. What is it? Correct. So here's his casket on day one. Here it is on day six. And he has staph aureus. And then what's the virulence factor of the communicard MRSA that causes massive pro-inflammation and necrosis your lung? And if it's in your skin, it necrosis your skin. And it has three letters. EDL. EDL, and it stands for Pantin Valentine Leukocytin. So that one, necrosis and massive inflammation. By the way, this isn't in the books, but we've had two cases now. And the guy is like sick as a dog. And both times we gave him all the right antibiotics with the steroids. And it just went now, if you don't want to give them steroids because it's not in the book, what can you give them to sort of decrease and dampen the pro-inflammation? Lenezolin, <laughs> Zyvox over Vaco. But that's not for all MRSA pneumonias. This is only for necrotizing pneumonia with MRSA. You want to give them lenezolin, okay? But I like to give them a little steroids, but you may not be able to get the pulmonologist to agree, but we did. It works nicely. So PBL positive necrosis. And look at this. If it's PBL positive, your mortality rate, we're not playing around here. This thing's bad. It's five times greater with PBL positive. 
Now, what other groups like to follow the flu and viruses are strep, pneumo, and hemophilus. So those are the big three that like to do that. Uh, this is necrotizing pneumonia. Um, Dr. Kasten did this, but it's not the she, it's the he. And you can see that this case here was necrotizing pneumonia at Moffitt. And one of the major bugs you see are Nicardias, Aspergillus, Klebsiella, Staph aureus, anaerobes. Depending on how fast it's happening, that's what you're going to see. If it's a heme patient, it'll be more of the molds and, and the nocardia. So if you pulled out all necrotizing pneumonia to PA, you could break them down into those categories uh, with the same kind of bugs, okay? They love to form necrotizing pneumonia. Okay, um, we left off with you. So this person now, the same guy, survives his necrotizing pneumonia it's three years later. And he has chronic bronchiectasis, and now he's got another virus, and now he's in the hospital. What bug loved to cause acute, and that's the virus in his sinus. There's his bronchiectasis. What bug do you think we're going to grow in his spit? That's the number one bug associated with bronchiectasis. Any guess? Pseudomonas. So he winds up growing pseudomonas and it's resistant to everything. And um, back in those days, we didn't have all these choices. We actually gave them inhaled colistin. And when do they give azithromycin for pseudomonas strategically? When do you do it? And cystic cirrhosis, and what's the idea of doing that? It doesn't kill the pseudomonas, but what does it do? It keeps the mucoid strain from growing, which is virulent and it allows the non-mucoid strain to grow. So that's a strategy they use for cystic fibrosis. I'm not sure how long it lasts, okay? Okay, um, we're in the back again. Hodgkin's patient, fever, dry cough, steroids are tapering, and the lungs look clear, but now they're ground glass, and the Gamori methionine silver stain is positive, GMS. So tapering steroids, Hodgkin's ground glass, and GMS stain positive, silver stain. And it's a fungus by ribosomal RNA, but we don't usually use antifungals. Any guess? Yeah. Right. Pneumocystis. We were talking about this yesterday, and Guy came up with this incredible paper. He said that people who died in a car accident in Brazil they looked at their lungs. These are just healthy, quote, people. And 50% of them are colonized with new systems. I go, wow, man, this stuff is everywhere. Okay, so you can find it, but does it really mean it's causing disease? So you have to have the right case. Okay, scary what's in your lungs. So the answer was the new cystis, okay? The key point was this tapering steroids in a non-AIDS patient and there's less organisms and higher mortality. You see it in the lymphomas and the lymphocytic leukemias, the T-cell immunodeficiency and the alphos. Okay, um, you're up for this one, right? So this is a lymphoma, steroids, progressively coughing, hypoxic, has pneumocystis, and here's the ground glass. And I have owl's eye inclusions and it's intracytoplasmic inclusions on my lung biopsy. So what do you think that is? CMV. Now, um, CMV in a non-AIDS patient, they tend to treat it. And then one astute student um, pointed out something that everybody else missed for 30 years, and you know what that is from this picture? This is a renal tubule and not a lung biopsy. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's pretty good. I'm not using photo. I messed it up now. Okay. Trying to. All right. You can just press it up. I'll just. I shouldn't touch this. I won't touch it because it'll be a police. So, uh, who, did, who answered that? You did? You're up for this one? 
Okay, sure. Uh, this is uh, named after a seed. Is it a mango, a papaya, a plum, or a millet seed? Probably a millet seed. Right, so what is a millet seed? It's a great you think of. Yeah, it's Miliary TB, right? Okay, so with that background, you get to answer this question. This guy has superficial bladder cancer. He's getting installation every week for five weeks. A month later, he's having fever, hypoxia, he's losing weight, and he has millet seeds in his lungs. So what is BCG doing to him? What's the name of BCG besides Bacillus coming great? What is it? It's uh, it's in the MTB complex. You're correct. If I had to tell micro, don't say it's in the MTB complex in this guy because everybody freaks out because it's not contagious. Is it bovis? It's attenuated mycobacterium bovis, and it is in the MTB complex. So that's what BCG is, and that's dissemination. Now, this guy can't go for transplant with his leukemia because he has nodules in his lungs that are increasing. They're almost the size of a millet seed, but they're a little bigger. And the bronch is negative, so we cut one out. And we found something that's found in Ohio, Missouri, Illinois. He has disseminated or he has lung histo. So with Vori, um, he's increasing here. And then with Vori, that's his lung biopsy. It's going away and he goes for transplant and he was a successful transplant. Okay, for your question, we got an 80 year old a lymphoma can pad, temperature 104 for weeks. He gets steroids for weeks. Now his arm is swelling. So they do a PET scan to rule out lymphoma. He's got millet seeds in his lungs. He's lighting up his lymph nodes here and here. His arm from his elbow to his wrist is lighting up, and they operate on his arm and drain it all the way down to the wrist. And his brain has millet seeds in it. So what do you think he has? This is not exotic. He has disseminated TB. We woke up his sleeping TB, and he survived with TB treatment. And rituximab, which knocks out your B lymphocytes, actually awoke, woke it up instead of a T cell loss. And then all the drugs that can cause TB to wake up can sometimes wake up histo and non tuberculous mycobacterium, and they can give you a granulomatous inflammation. That guy had it sleeping in him for 50 years. So this stuff can reactivate when you get the right drug and get these disseminated infections. Okay, for your question, we got a big mass, guys on chronic steroids, and there's the gram positive filament, this rod modified acid fast positive. And uh, of course, they gave it away. Okay, Now, for your question, the modified acid fast chain is positive. You kind of carry pneumonia, and the nitro lab says it's not going to turn you up. And it's associated with baby horses. So, what's the notoria like? The other is actually the equestrian. It occurs in only patients and cancer patients. Rotocox is actually it's modified after that. And we call it the case series of the patients. Okay, number 15, uh, for your question, we have a leukemia, pancytopenia, progressively short of breath, and dry cough, ground glass, diffuse, and the deeper the bronch goes, the redder it looks. DAH. And that is called diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, and the treatment is high-dose steroids a gram a day of sodium and draw. Okay, we're getting to the end for your question. This kid was pulled out of the water near drowning, develops post-drowning ARDS, and winds up on a vent. And then after steroids and several weeks, he has 
nodules in his lung and nodules in his brain. So what do you get in a near drowning event? Uh, good guess. Any yeah. on? C. dysporium. Right. Very good. So that is the correct answer for your boyfriends. It's C. dysporium or aspergillus. It's a mold in the water. Okay. So uh, what is the most likely bug? Well, you know, anemonis is in water, other gram negatives, meliodosis, aspergillus, and C. dysporium. Uh, meliodosis, which is Burkholder isunomenii, used to be out in Asia, and it's now found where? Closer to us. This is a CDC alert. It's Texas to Florida. It's along the Gold Coast. So you are now in meliodosis territory. But okay. there have been some cases in Puerto Rico too. Okay, so it's now in our hemisphere. So <laughs> you get out this meliodosis. And finally, we close with these numbers, which we already quoted to you. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.